Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to our live coverage of the dedication of the Barbara Johns Building, formerly the 9th Street Office Building in Richmond. Right across the street from Capitol Square, the 9th Street Office Building uh, was put up in uh, 1904 as the Hotel Richmond and for the first 50 years of its existence it served as the site of political activity and social activity in the city for the last 50 years. It has been the 9th Street office building, and after a $70 million renovation, it's now, uh, today, will be dedicated as the Barbara Johns Building in honor of the 16-year-old civil rights leader. We'll have all the festivities for you here, and we invite you to stay tuned. As we try to begin the ceremony, I'm certain that the people who are standing will, are glad to hear that. We will begin very shortly. I am simply going to go and check on our platform guests and program participants, and we'll be right back to start the program. Good morning once again and welcome. I'm Cynthia Hudson, Deputy Attorney General. It is Chief Deputy Attorney General. I do my it is my <laughs> Thank you, Governor. It is my sincere pleasure today to welcome you all to this truly magnificent and historically significant home of the Department of Law of the Commonwealth of Virginia, also known as our state's law firm where some 400 attorneys and staff do our very best every day to protect and defend and promote the legal interests of the Commonwealth and its residents. 
And of course, it's about to become an even more historically significant building with today's event. I cannot tell you how proud I am, how honored I am, and quite frankly, how very full my heart is right now to have the opportunity to participate in this tremendously important day in our state government's history. By guiding you through the ceremonial dedication of this state building in honor of Virginia's and the nation's student civil rights activist, Barbara Johns, to whom I am personally indebted for her role in making it possible for me to speak to you today and to introduce myself to you as the Chief Deputy Attorney General of Virginia. And quite frankly, to whom we're all personally indebted for helping to change the course of our states and our nation's history. But I'm going to leave it to our program participants to more fully exalt Barbara Johns' spirit, her bravery, determination, and lasting contribution to the changes in constitutional interpretation that set us on the path to truly begin to realize the stated commitment to equality under the law that is embodied in the supreme law of our land, the Constitution of the United States. But of course, certain introductions and recognitions are in order at this time. And first among them, of course, is that of the man who is technically our landlord in this building, <laughs> but even more significant to this event and to this occasion, the man whose idea it was to honor Barbara Johns in this way as we do today. It is, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to recognize the Honorable Terrence R. McAuliffe, the 72nd Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Please also welcome our jurisdictional host today, the Honorable LeVar Stoney, Mayor of the City of Richmond. We're proud to have with us, too, the Honorable Ralph Northam, Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And your co-host today, the Honorable Mark R. Herring, Attorney General of Virginia. First Lady of Virginia, Dorothy McAuliffe. And First Lady of the Attorney General's Office, Laura Herring, <laughs> wife of Attorney General Herring. And here today, representing the Honorable Mark Warner, United States Senator from Virginia, is Kiana Connor, I believe. Kiana, please stand. For the Honorable Tim Kaine, Senator from Virginia. Tyee Davenport, I believe, is here. For the Honorable Bobby Scott, United States House of Representatives, his, his Chief of Staff, Joni Ivey, is with us. And here himself, actually, is the Honorable Donald McEachin, United States House of Representatives. We thank and welcome as well the Honorable Cleo Powell, Justice of the Supreme Court of Virginia, for joining us today. And of course, at this time, we'd like to recognize and welcome uh, the members of the governor's cabinet. Please stand, members of the governor's office. I'd like to recognize as well the appointed members of the attorney general's office. If you're here, please stand, or you're probably already standing. <laughs> Members of the Virginia Senate, please be recognized. Stand or wave your hands. <laughs> Members of the Virginia House of Delegates as well, glad to have you with us. We're also pleased and honored to have with us a few other special guests, those with particular ties to the events and history underlying this dedication today. In particular, retired Virginia State Senator and law partner of the late Oliver Hill, Henry Marsh, is with us today. Also uniquely and indelibly connected to these events, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund is represented today by Monique Dixon. 
She's back there. Hello. I'm going to introduce together W. Taylor Reevely, President of Longwood University, and Professor Larissa Ferguson of Longwood University, who is also the liaison to the Robert Russa Moton Museum in Farmville. So Professor Ferguson is doing double duty today in terms of her representation. But I wanted to make sure that I recognize these two individuals and, and institutions uh, in sync, particularly because they have historically recently joined together in partnership where they say that they stand poised to work together in affiliation and in mutual service of their respective missions, which are to advance civil rights in education and in the preparation of citizen leaders. Thank you for being with us today. And I have saved for last, but only out of very special deference and in order that the honor of the moment may be sufficiently savored, introduction of the sister of Barbara Johns and a participant in the historic events we recognize today. Joan Johns Cobbs is with us as a speaker today. And of course, I want to recognize the entire Johns family who was able to join us today. They're here in force, daughters, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters. Please stand and be recognized in the Commonwealth. Again, thanks each and every one of you for being with us today. I thought I would be welcoming at this time to deliver an invocation, the Reverend J. Samuel Williams, who uh, formerly or currently is pastor at Levi Baptist Church in Prince Edward County and was a classmate of Barbara Johns and participated in the famous walkout uh, that, that, that marks her place in history. However, unfortunately, Reverend um, Williams fell ill is in the hospital this morning. We certainly pray for his fast recovery. However, Congressman McEachin has agreed to deliver that invocation, and we thank him for his prompt response. Thank you, and good morning. Won't you pray with me, please? Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day that we have never seen before and that we will never see again. We thank you for the temperate weather, we thank you for all those who are assembled here. Father, we thank you for the gift that you gave us in Barbara Johns. For in her, you endowed her with the courage to seek justice, to seek equality, and to seek freedom. It is right and just that we name this building in her honor, and we pray mightily that all who occupy this building and all who come here come in that spirit of justice, equality, and freedom. And let the children of God say, Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Congressman. At this time, it's, it's, it's my pleasure, distinct pleasure, to make the following introduction. But let me start first by saying that I came into the position I presently occupy very wide eyed and excited about the professional challenge that lay ahead. And, my excitement was fueled in a very large part by the vision of the man I was to work for and alongside. A man I've come to know from firsthand observation and experience as a true guardian of the public interest. And of course, what's in the best public interest is sometimes a variable concept. But I can tell you that what he sees as in the public interest is a vision we share. It's a vision of one Virginia, made only stronger by its diversity, and its recognition of the fundamental and human and civil rights of all of us. Accordingly, in my estimation, there is no one more fitting at this time in our history to occupy this building as Virginia's Attorney General. Because he personifies and works for everything I ever thought the law should be about, helping us, protecting us, keeping us safe, and clearing the obstacles to the realization of the American dream for all of us. Your Attorney General, Mark Herring. Good morning, everybody. 
Cynthia, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, but more importantly, thank you for your service to our Commonwealth. Change in this Commonwealth and this country has always come when brave individuals stand up and demand their rights. And so often, it has been led by a young person who can see injustice with clear eyes. In 1951, a young Virginian did an extraordinary thing. Barbara Rose Johns looked at her cramped, dilapidated schoolhouse. She saw an injustice for exactly what it was, and she stood up for what was right. She demanded that which the Constitution guaranteed her and which her Commonwealth denied her. Just 16 years old, and yet putting one foot in front of the other, she began a journey that would wind its way all the way to the highest court in the land, facing off against monumental adversaries, including her own state government and generations of the way things have always been. And in Virginia, there are few things as powerful as the way things have always been. Amen. As Barbara herself said, it seemed like reaching for the moon. Soon after their courageous walkout, Barbara, her classmates at Moton, their families, and their amazing attorneys from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund found themselves facing off in court against the man who then held this job, the Attorney General of Virginia. It's somewhat shocking to remember that in 1952, the Attorney General of Virginia initially won that case. He won the case, but at what cost and for what gain? Did it advance the cause of liberty to convince the court that segregation was a part of Virginia's culture and history? Did it promote justice to argue against all common sense and decency that segregation affected white and black students equally? Did winning that case give one more Virginia child a shot at achieving their dreams? It took the United States Supreme Court to make plain what had, should have been clear all along, that separate is inherently unequal and that no American should suffer the indignity of discrimination, especially when imposed with the sanction of the law. You'll see as you leave here today that the wall behind you bears the words justice, equality, and opportunity. I think about those words a lot. What they mean to us as Americans. What they mean to me and to my team working on behalf of the people of Virginia. With every decision I make, I try to think about whether we are pursuing justice, whether we are promoting equality, and whether we are expanding opportunity for all Virginians. Because the Attorney General isn't just the government's lawyer. The Attorney General has a special obligation to fight for and protect the people he or she serves. And that is why it is so fitting, even restorative, that the building we call home will bear the name of Barbara Johns and serve as a daily reminder that the injustices of the past must not be repeated. We have come so far since that walkout in 1951, even as we recognize how far still we have yet to go. It is shameful that Virginia denied so many of her own sons and daughters an opportunity to pursue their dreams and get an education, first through segregation, then the massive resistance to integration that was plotted, in some cases, in this very building when it was the Hotel Richmond. That injustice reverberates through generations, and we still have work to do to heal the wounds. But today, I cannot help but feel optimistic and hopeful as the children and family of Barbara Johns stand 
side by side with the governor and the attorney general of Virginia to dedicate this building in her honor. The Barbara Johns building will be a lasting daily reminder to me, to my team, to all who pass through those doors and all who visit our capital, that progress is not always linear or inevitable. Change doesn't just happen. Justice requires courage. It is something that we must commit ourselves to every single day. And when confronted with injustice, we must not turn away or wait for someone else to fix it. When we are confronted with injustice, we must see it for what it is. We must be like Barbara Johns and stand up for what is right. And now it is my pleasure to introduce a man who I know we can always count on to do what is right. Governor Terry McAuliffe has been a tireless fighter for economic and social justice and for giving every Virginian a shot at their dreams. And under his leadership, this historic building has become the Barbara Johns Building. Ladies and gentlemen, the 72nd Governor of Virginia, His Excellency Terry McAuliffe. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a great day. And I think we're doing this in the greatest state in the United States of America, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And we should never forget that, folks. They're not doing this anywhere else in America, only right here. I am so honored to be here, and I want to thank our great Attorney General, Mark Herring, and his team, and our Lieutenant Governor, Ralph Northam, who is here also today. We have fought, and when you hear the uh, words of quality, justice, and opportunity, at a difficult time right now in our country about opportunity and equality, I just want you to know this team here has fought for you each and every way, and we are a better Commonwealth because of Ralph Northam and Mark Herring, and I thank you for your leadership there. It's great to be with the greatest mayor in America, Mayor Stoney. Great to be with you here in Richmond. I uh, thank you. I also want to recognize and thank the Johns family. We've had a great time together. They actually spent the night in the governor's mansion. I apologize. I have not been the best host. I got home very late last night, and I left at 6 this morning, so I haven't seen it. But I know that they've done a great job for you over at the mansion. I thank you. But if you could stand when I mention your name, if you could, for the daughters, Kelly, Dawn, and Terry, if you could stand up and give them a great round of applause, if you could. Thank you. To the siblings who are here with us today, Joan, Robert, Ernest, Roderick, please stand up and give them a great round of applause. I also want to give a special thanks to our Secretary of Administration, Nancy Rodriguez, and her team at Department of General Services, and Chris and the team in the Department of Historic Resources, because folks, but for their efforts, we would not be having this in this beautifully new, restored building. If you give them a great round of applause. So how did we come about naming this building Barbara Johns Building? As governor, you get a lot of power. You also have the ability to name buildings. <laughs> so like anything else, we have a process. And for six months, my team came back to me with name after name. Some lovely great old justices here. <laughs> it just didn't fit where I thought we needed to go as a commonwealth. So I assembled the team in my office and said, we're going to name this building after Barbara Johns. Why? Because you think of the history of a 16-year-old girl on April 23rd, 1951. And I remind everybody, think of the times. This was before the Little Rock Nine. This was before Rosa Parks. This was before Martin Luther King. This was a 16-year-old girl who said that we will not tolerate separate and unequal. We will not stand by for it. So she assembled 
five of her fellow students, and they hatched their scheme. And in that first meeting, she quoted the book of Isaiah. She said, the young woman will lead the way. And then on April 23rd, she had the president of the student council get on a phone and call the principal and put a hanky over the phone and say, your students are in downtown right now. You need to come get them. The principal left, and at that point, 450 students went into the gymnasium, and they kicked out all the teachers. A 16-year-old put her life on the line. This is the first time we'd seen anything like it in the United States of America. But she was sick and tired of going to a school that was unequal, overcrowding. Students had to go into buses. They had to wear winter coats throughout the winter because it was freezing in the classrooms. There were no science labs. So she stepped up to the plate. That's courage. And because of her, through the great work of Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson, through the Board of Brown Education, guess what happened? It ended. But it would not have ended. Five suits came together, but it would not have ended had it not been for the real spark plug. And that spark plug was our own, Barbara Johns. And I am so proud to be here today to honor this spectacular woman. Not only for what she did, but we as Virginians need to remember that we stand on her shoulders. We need to continue to fight here in the Commonwealth for opportunities for all. What she did on April 23rd, 1951, I had my proudest moment on April 22nd last year when I stood on those steps of that Capitol and restored the rights of 206,000 former felons in the Commonwealth of Virginia. At the time, it was the single largest enfranchisement of rights of any governor in the history of the United States of America. People deserve second chances. We need to lead here in Virginia to provide people that opportunity to be successful. It's why we've reformed our education system. We put a billion dollars in last year. Everybody is entitled to a great education. We need our children in our classrooms, not in courtrooms. We need to lead to make sure everybody has that quality education. So I'm honored to be here today to dedicate this building to a 16-year-old woman who had the courage to lead. And I will tell everybody in this room, it is incumbent upon all of us to stand on her shoulders and take the Commonwealth of Virginia in this nation to the next level. Thank you very much. Let me bring up someone very special. Joan Johns Cobb was with her sister. She had a front row seat to history. Most of us have to read history. She can tell us history because she was there and she was a partner with her sister Barbara. So let's give a great round of welcome to Joan and thank her for being here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Joan Johns Cobbs, and I am the sister of the student who, in 1951, walked out of school along with 400, and, uh, 400 or more students, and that was in, on April 23, 1951. Barbara was just 16 years old. Thank you. Barbara was just 16 years old. And that walkout was at a time when 
things were dangerous in Virginia. First of all, I meant to say thank you to Governor McCulloch and the First Lady and to Attorney General Mark Heron and his First Lady. <clears throat> On behalf of the Johns family, we thank you. We thank you so much. We are so excited, ecstatic, and words can hardly express how we are feeling today. Pardon me if I get a little emotional. I would like to share with you some of Barbara's comments in her own words. This was, uh, this was a program, I'm sorry, this was her diary that was left after she passed away and her husband found it in the bedroom. I'm going to read this to you now. These are Barbara's own words. We were fond of our teachers. My favorite and the one that had the greatest impact on me upon my young life was Miss Davenport, my music teacher. who I later, who later married Mr. Jones, who was the principal of the school. Besides introducing us to the classics, Miss Davenport also introduced us to music. In fact, she was our piano teacher. She permitted full expressions in her classes, something that was quite foreign to most of the classes. Most teachers taught, and you listened, and you responded to, to everything that was said. But Miss Davenport felt that everything in life lent itself to a variety of opinions, thoughts, moments, moods, much the same as in the music. And she encouraged you to respond that way. I got to know her more intimately when she became a music teacher. For my sister and I, when we took piano lessons, she felt, I felt she could, I felt I could share my most innermost thoughts with her, and she wouldn't consider them ridiculous. This is how I happened to mention to her how unhappy I was with the school building and its inadequacies. I told her that it wasn't fair that we had such a poor facility, equipment, etc., when our white counterparts enjoyed science laboratories, a huge facility, a separate gym department, etc. I warmed to my subject and looked to her for some answer to my frustration. She paused for a few minutes and asked, well, why don't you do something about it? I was surprised at her question, but it didn't occur to me to know what she meant. I just slowly turned away, and I felt she had dismissed me with that reply. What could one do about such a situation? I had no idea. But I spent many days in my favorite hangout in the woods. 
on my favorite stump, contemplating it all. I sat by the creek where Sadie Red drank. Sadie Red was our horse. <laughs> and I thought about it. My imagination would run rampant, and I would dream that some mighty man of great wealth would build us this great new school building, and that our parents got together and surprised us with, this grand, with the news of this grand building, and that we had a big celebration. I even imagined that a great storm came through and blew down the main building, splattered the shacks into splinters. And out of this wreckage rose this magnificent, magnificent, magnificent building. And all the students were joyous, and even the teachers cried. But then reality would set in, and I would be forced to acknowledge that nothing magical was going to happen to get us a new school. And, <clears throat> and there were times that I just prayed, God, please grant us a new school. Please let us have a warm place to stay where we wouldn't have to keep our coats on all day to stay warm. God, please help us. We are your children too. This type of thinking went on for months. And sometimes as I chopped the wood, as I fed the pigs, whenever I did work, or sat quietly, it would crop up in my mind because I felt we were not being treated like any other students. Their classes were not held in the auditorium. They were not cold. They didn't have to leave the building and transfer to another one. Their buses were not overcrowded. Their teacher and bus driver didn't have to make the fire every morning before we could start classes. One morning, I was so busy rushing my brothers and sister down the hill to school that I forgot my own lunch and had to run back up the hill to retrieve it. In the meantime, the bus arrived, picked them up, and left me standing there by the roadside. I was waiting for another bus to come, and uh, the white bus came by, half empty, on its way to Farmville High School. It would have to pass by my school to get to that school, but I couldn't ride with them. Right then and there, I decided that indeed something had to be done about this inequality. But I felt I didn't know what. All day my mind and thoughts were whirling. And as I lay in my bed, my mind began to wander and I prayed for help. That night, whether in a dream or whether I was awake, but I felt I was awake, a plan began to formulate in my mind. A plan I felt that was divinely inspired because I hadn't been able to think of anything until then. That plan was to assemble together the student council members whom I considered the creme de la creme of the school. However, they, uh, some of them, uh, whom I considered the creme de la creme, however, they were smart and they were thinkers. I knew them and I trusted them and I was a part of them. 
From this, we would formulate a plan to go on a strike. We would make signs and I would give a speech stating our dissatisfaction and we would march out of the school. People would hear us, they would see us and understand our difficulty. They would sympathize with our plight and would grant us a new school building. Our teachers would be proud and the students would be happy. It would be grand and we would live happily ever after. Fully confident that all of this would transpire, I arose early the next morning, rushed to get everyone out, and I could hardly wait to get to school to call this meeting. I was self-sufficient and independent because my mother wasn't around to help out and I couldn't consult with her about it and my father was too busy plowing and planting and harvesting to have time to pay attention to any fantasy of mine and he would have considered it foolish he never would have agreed with it but he wouldn't have stopped me I was permitted free reign in my thinking and acting and I was too stubborn and too determined to have my way anyway I didn't consult my uncle Vernon because he wasn't around and really I didn't see a need to consult anyone anyway it had been given to me and all I had to do was do it that's the end of her quote I would just like to say on a personal note that Barbara was a strong-willed, determined, studious, stubborn, and bossy person. <laughs> she was also very uh, sincere, honest, and forthright in her comments. She never minced her words, so you knew where she stood on any subject at any time. <laughs> People often ask me, how did I think she was able to do what she did? And I say to them, first and foremost, I think it was divine intervention, as she said in her memoir. And of course, I feel that our Uncle Vernon Johns had a lot of influence over her life, as well as ours. He was a brilliant, outspoken, and fearless person who always strived to educate us, challenging us in his own way. For instance, every time we saw him, he would ask us a black history question. And if he did, we didn't know the answer, he would chastise us. And that forced us to read more and to learn because when we saw him, we wanted to be able to answer his questions. We had access to his extensive library, so we had no excuse. It forced us to learn a lot, and we admired him so much. He was a brilliant man. Um, I would like to say to you 
as I think about Barbara, I think about this passage in the Bible that is Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the battling together, and a little child shall lead them. I really, in my heart, feel that Barbara did what she did because she was a strong, brave, courageous person. And seeing an injustice, she decided to do something about it. She stood up for what she believed, and she made a difference. She has made us so proud of her. I wish she could have been able to experience what is happening to her today. And I want to thank you once again, Governor McCulloch, and thank you, Attorney General Herring. And also, I would like to thank Casey Easley Minor, Director of the, of the uh, Executive Mansion, and and Cynthia Hudson, Chief Deputy of Counter General, and all of the staff that helped. We really appreciate everything you have done. This is a wonderful day. This is a wonderful occasion. It's a blessing. And um, just to go back a little bit, um, you remember back in 1951, those times were very um, different in that the little town we were from, Barnville, Virginia, when she took a stand like that, it was a dangerous time. And I was the one who was worried about what might happen to us. She didn't seem to have any fear at all. But I did, because my grandmother had told me some stories about the KKK. And I was worried that the KKK would come and take us away. And I remember very well that Barbara had to go to Montgomery, Alabama to live with our Uncle Vernon because there were threats. And my parents decided that it would be best for her to spend her senior year in Montgomery, Alabama, where she graduated and later on went to um, Spelman College. And just on a personal note, you can imagine how traumatic that time was for all of us because she had to go away, which meant we didn't have the whole family together. It was very painful. And then also there were times when after she passed, there were periods of time that we saw and witnessed some of the people in the community trying to discredit Barbara. And it was very painful, particularly to me. And I remember writing 
letter after letter to the Palmville Herald and then tearing them up. I never sent them because I felt like Barbara was telling me, just leave it alone. Don't worry about it. That eventually everything would be okay. And I listened. And eventually, you see what has happened. Her legacy has been firmly entrenched in history with the monument on the Capitol grounds and also now this beautiful building, proving once again that patience is a virtue. <laughs> I thank you again from the bottom of my heart. I don't have words enough to express how excited I feel about this. And I thank you on behalf of all the Johns family. We are just so appreciative and grateful. I thank you all for coming and may, and may God continue to bless you all and may God bless America. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. So wonderful to hear Barbara's words and your sentiments on her and on that time. At this time, I ask Governor McAuliffe, Lieutenant Governor Northam, Attorney General Herring, to join the daughters of Barbara Johns, Dawn, Kelly, and Terry, at the veiled area here on the right side of the atrium for the formal dedication of this building. Someone's going to provide the governor a mic, I understand. A handheld. I hereby dedicate this building, the Barbara Johns Building. Yeah.